The new dad, ah, Billy Embody. Congratulations, buddy, to you and the wifey for the newest addition to the family. How's it been? Couple of weeks on dad duty, buddy. And uh, any sleep? How we feeling? Feeling great, guys. Thanks for having me. It's it's good to be back. And uh, yeah, we're we're getting by day by day. Feel like we're pretty lucky uh, on the sleep front. Uh, at least I am. My wife is is obviously the star of the show, but. Um, you know, doing everything for him at this point. But uh, yeah, we're loving it. It's been great. Absolutely. Congratulations, Bill. I think this is Bill's first public appearance as a dill. Oh, That's nice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Freshly shaved. That's right. Really looking fresh this morning. Gave him the dill tag. Uh, yeah, yeah I right. had to go baby face for you. <laughs> uh, Bill, you saw the news on the transfer portal yesterday. This is something that uh, obviously you, at some point it's just going to be open season, right? I mean, it seems like every time we talk about it, it's just some type of deregulation of what was in place. What was your reaction to yesterday's news? Yeah, I, I think you're you're seeing a lot of the the NCAA just like you said, kind of be deregulated, disarmed. Um, we're, we're we already really saw. I feel like the biggest move earlier this spring, which is that the collectives can actually be the ones talking to players. And so that pretty much makes tampering legal as well. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little surprised that it hasn't been more active in terms of bigger name players entering this spring. But at the end of the day, everybody is fighting to keep their players as well. Nobody's just going to let them walk out the door. Uh, we saw some big names like Dominic Williams from TCU go in yesterday that was a big one. Damian Martinez from Oregon State has been one that's been in the portal for a while. Um, there, there are really players in the spring portal window that are viewed as potential plug-and-play veteran players uh, that can really help your team right away. And, and that's where the money, on, in some cases, can get a little out of hand and those guys can be tipped in. And then it's kind of, like you said, open season on them. And again, the deregulation could change, help other players go in, uh, maybe more, and, and it gets a little bit wilder here as we go through this two-week window. But uh, for the most part, I feel like it's been a little less active uh, than what I kind of thought at certain positions. But at the same time, you're, you're guys who have gone through spring practices, they've gone with everything, gone through everything with their coaches, their new coaches in some cases, and so they have a feel of where they stand. And, you know, I mean, if I was a college player I, and I didn't like my situation, I would have prioritized making a change in the winter uh, portal window and done that. And because now you've gone through spring and, and players have cemented themselves on depth charts in a way. And so when you have a summer where you have to learn everything through another teammate rather than, you know, meeting with these coaches as in depth as you need to, you're almost set up better for success if you stay where you are mm -hmm. uh, unless you really need a change of scenery or if you're able to capitalize on a, a large sum of money or just that much better of a situation like we're seeing in some cases. Uh, over the last 72 hours, LSU's seen a little movement into the portal, including yesterday's news of Kai Prion, wide receiver out of St. James, putting his name in, Connor Gilbreth, the tight end who transferred in last summer, uh, is, is in the portal. And then we saw Jackson Howard earlier uh, this week, make the move, Bill. What do you make of the move? Uh, what do you make uh, of of LSU uh, losing those guys and any potential on where they may land? Yeah, I, I think Kai is is one where uh, he's from Louisiana. He's well known, a prospect who came up out of St. James. Was kind of viewed as somebody who maybe could play defense, could play offense. And once that starts happening, I mean, even I remember Devontae Lee, as much as I loved him coming out, once they started toying around with, those oh, are going to be wide receivers, are he going to be a defensive back? That isn't always a good thing. Uh, usually you want to see a guy have the ability, the talent, athleticism to play both, but they slot him at one and they say, wow, you're awesome. We're going to ride with you there. And so he's going to probably, I think, drop down to, to a group of five school and get an opportunity to play and compete a lot more than he would at LSU. And I think Tulane is, is a school that I would circle maybe some of the other in-state schools like UL, um, Louisiana Tech, maybe get involved there. Uh, he had some you know, uh, power 
five offers uh, at the end of his recruitment, like Mississippi State and Auburn that were in the mix. But I think he probably sticks closer to home and ends up at Tulane at this point. Uh, and that'll be a really good fit for him. I think I'll have an opportunity to do a lot of good things with John Summerall's program there. And then with Jackson Howard, uh, it seems like a lot of people are pegging Minnesota early on. Honestly, the nice thing in a way, once guys transfer is I don't really have to track them as much. <laughs> on the flip side, we're trying to you know, see what C.J. West, the Kent State defensive tackle, is going to do or Philip Blit- Blitty, uh, the, the Indiana defensive tackle transfer that they hosted, is going to do. Uh, but Jackson Howard is a big kind of defensive end who might not have been twitchy enough to play the true edge spot. I think he could go to Minnesota. And then Connor Gilbreth is that big Juco blocking tight end that they brought in before last season. I feel like he can play somewhere. Uh, it's just a matter of what program is the right fit for him, whether it be playing tight end or playing, you know, bulking up and, and playing offensive tackle. Uh, we saw Brian Kelly say after the spring game that they are in the market for defensive tackles. That the, that's what they're going after. In fact, that might be the only position that they target in this season's portal. Uh, Bill, you've got good relationships both in Texas and Louisiana. Yesterday we saw uh, Dominic Williams, TCU, defensive tackle, put his name in. Um, what's that mean, obviously, for the Horned Frogs, and does LSU have a chance? Yeah, uh, there, there's some people that, are, of course, are, are talking about LSU right away with Dominic Williams. He's going to visit Oklahoma this weekend, and, and so the Sooners uh, probably just as much as LSU have been really trying to address the defensive tackle position. They're hoping they're they're hosting uh, Philip Blitty this weekend, the Indiana defensive line transfer that LSU hosted earlier this spring. And with Dominic Williams, though, he's somebody that I know pretty well. Uh, I've co- I covered him as a recruit. He has been somebody that really outperformed his recruiting ranking. He was really, really uh, huge coming out of high school. He needed a weight room and to kind of slim down. And he bought in right away at TCU and played a lot and, and has been a key guy for the Horn Frogs the last couple of years. He's also been somebody that has been rumored at about every single transfer portal window to be going in and TCU has been able to fend off other programs up until now. And so this is a a player that has already probably has relationships elsewhere uh, from the last year of just this day and age (laughs) of college football. And so LSU, if they don't get a visit right away, uh, you could probably cross them off the list. I've heard, Oklahoma, of course, now that that he's visiting there, but USC, where he's from in Southern California, Texas A&M. Um, I mean, it's kind of a who's who for a defensive tackle like that as well as LSU. So I'm sure they're trying to get in there and, and make it happen. But it, it's also a, a guy that has been um, on transfer radars for a while. Uh, and, and now that he's in, I mean, he's he's a day one starter for whatever team he goes to, in my opinion, out, outside of a select few programs that just had, you know, first round pick coming back or something like that. He's, he's really strong at the point of attack. He'd help a lot if LSU can get him to visit and end up in Baton Rouge. Is that what the transfer portal has pretty much become where it's not only you're all, you're tampering maybe throughout the year and nobody can really prove it. And then it becomes with NIL and the conflation of the portal that it, I'm just going to go to the highest bidder. Yeah, it depends. It, re- it really depends on the whole highest bidder piece because some of these players are, um, you know, there, there's an offense tackle that, that I'm, I'm aware of that, you know, is getting half a million dollars to go play at a program and, and he's going to, you know, end up going there and he's, he's going to start and he's going to be a centerpiece for their offensive line. There are other programs that uh, have been able to secure players for less than maybe what they got on the open market, but still a, a very large sum of money. Whenever you're talking about the trenches, I mean, that's the premier kind of spring transfer portal position, I feel like. Schools that feel like they need to upgrade their offensive and defensive lines. And so there there can be highest bidder situations. There, there also can just be that, you know, everybody's offering a lot of money. Which place do I feel like I can go, feel most comfortable, and also make an impact? Uh, so, that, so that's kind of the situation. And then throughout the year, I, like there are programs that tamper there. Are, it's mainly collectives now, especially that's legal. I mean, the schools definitely stay out of the way. I feel like a little bit more because they can just, you know, the collectives can do it. Uh, but yeah, you, you hear rumors all year round, like, okay, all right, the portal window is coming up. Keep an eye on this guy. And that, and that rumor can come from 
you know, a, 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 a scouting department and a, the school itself that the player's at or a collective or a high school coach or a trainer or, I mean, sometimes if, if you're in good enough, kind of the player himself. So there's not too much turning in on, I feel like, tampering. There, there are moments where some schools become aware and maybe try to, you know, give a nudge to another school to kind of back away. But again, now it's legal with the collectives talking to them. So most third parties handle it all, which is where everybody can kind of say, stay clean in a sense. But yeah, there are rumors kind of all year round of, oh, I, I think this guy's going to go in and, and he'll probably go here if he does. And so you're honestly just keeping an eye on some of that. And I, I think it's, it's not fun to, to have to pay attention to, but it certainly adds a different element when you're looking at uh, players that may be redshirt as well throughout the year and you see them hit four games and then all of a sudden they get hurt or something like that. It, it can you know, ultimately lead to a transfer. I uh, saw a big commitment last weekend for LSU on spring football weekend, a prospect that has been flying up the recruiting charts in running back TJ Lindsay out of Ash uh, here in Louisiana. Obviously, this is a, a cycle that has um, a lot of talent in the running back spot. Uh, LSU now has two with Harlem Berry and Lindsay. Uh, what did you make of Lindsay's commitment and what does that make now with the recruiting at that position? Yeah, I, I thought this was a really smart take by Frank Wilson, and uh, on three moved him up into the on three hundred. <clears throat> on three hundred, he's the number one hundred fifty eighth overall prospect, number eleven running back in the country. So we think really highly of him. He, uh, you know, there at Alexandria, he had a really good junior season. He's had a really nice run of um, of track times as well, sub eleven hundred meter times. He's really been able to break out in that regard too, which is nice to see, and. Um, you know, I think Frank Wilson and, and this staff, they have Harlan Berry on board, which is the number one running back in the country, a five-star, a household name across the recruiting industry. And then you've been recruiting James Simon for multiple years, pretty much since they got back to, to LSU when it comes to, you know, Frank returning. And, I mean, he's taking his visits. He's taking his time with his process, which I don't fault James for. I mean, Coach's son – um, they know the business about as well as anyone out there. And I, I think for, for Frank Wilson, he just ultimately saw JT Lindsay as a guy that they probably needed to offer and, and he deserved an offer after his junior season. And so they decided to make a move. They, they probably wanted maybe James Simon to commit and shut things down and then take JT Lindsay, uh, just from the standpoint of, you know, James is your, your run, your other running back. You've been recruiting. I mean, they really only recruited Harlan Berry and James Simon, but then they looked deeper into JT Lindsay and said, "You know what? Let's go ahead and offer him." So, big pickup. I mean, I, I really like what he brings to the table. So, a definite take and a really highly thought of process, uh, prospect, especially for us at on three with James. Now, I mean, if I'm LSU, I'm taking three running backs, and and I think with James Simon, the thing is, is that you know this is somebody that really throughout the process we kind of talked about all right well they're recruiting these two running backs i mean that's a must must land running back and then you have jt Lindsay emerging so kind of takes the must land piece off of james simon a little bit but you know frank wilson's known that family for a long time sherman wilson's known that family for a long time he, it's one of those recruiting battles that i mean you don't want him to go to texas notre dame alabama some of the other schools that he's really high up on and, and a&m as well and if he does, I mean, you have two very, very good running backs committed in Harlem Berry and JT Lindsay, but I think they need three. And all three of these running backs in Louisiana bring a little something different to the table. They're all very, very good. Let the best best man or you know, best couple running backs out of this class win out and, and one will probably ultimately move on down the line if they can get all three. I, I feel like to you know, you can get JT Lindsay and lock him down quickly and get him on board. But James Simon is somebody that you've recruited for so long. You want to see LSU win that battle because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want the top talent to leave Louisiana. And with all the ties that they have, I feel like they still need to show that, hey, we need to get uh, James Simon on board. So I'd like to see them take three running backs where, where the running back room is. And 
if they can do that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they hope it can be James Simon. Ellis, you got good news from DeCorian Moore last week. I know he's been committed for a while, and he looks like the best wide receiver in the class by, by, by a long shot. Um, obviously, the threat of Texas always looms with an in-state prospect of, of his caliber being there. But what he said last weekend I thought was pretty glowing for LSU. What did you read into him saying that he was 1,000% committed to LSU, uh, to the Tigers? Uh, anytime a recruit puts a percentage on it, I just tune it out, <laughs> quite honestly. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I just feel like sometimes it just ends up being a meme uh, or, or something uh, later on in the process. But, no, with DeCorian, I really feel like LSU sits in a good spot to keep him. And I could see a world where he signs with LSU and, and, and he goes on to be the next, you know, great receiver. And, and this would be a massive, massive recruiting win for Cortez Hankton to go into – you know, Duncanville High School and and a place where Texas just landed Colin Simmons and uh, brought him on board, a teammate of DeCorian Moore, and, and beat out LSU for him and goes and wins on DeCorian Moore. And there's also a world where DeCorian Moore ends up going somewhere else to probably Texas or Oregon or Ohio State. And, you know, that's what happens, though, in these recruitments of these top five prospects. I mean, they are that highly thought of. These schools aren't going to go away. And Steve Sarkeesian has tried to really recruit Texas well. He's had mixed results on that front in terms of keeping top talent at home. But they have, in the last couple of years, been able to circle at least one or two guys that they say, all right, we have to keep this player home. And that's what they're probably going to try and do with DeCorian Moore. Now, DeCorian Moore is very high on LSU. He's committed here he sees the vision for what he can do and what he can accomplish and he loves the program i mean that's that's also the reality of it so um he's a really really good prospect who's a really really good kid who has a really good understanding of what all four of these schools can do for him uh in a multitude of ways and at this stage i mean like he said i mean he's locked in i think he is locked in and uh, he'll take some other official visits, and we'll see if that changes things. But right now, with Bryce Underwood continuing to recruit him, Harlan Berry in the backfield, uh, you can see, and, and DeCorian Moore is one, but also Kalik Lockett, a five-star wide receiver from the Dallas area, is really high on LSU as well. And they see, and I talked with Kalik Tuesday night and went out and watched him train. These guys see Bryce Underwood, and they see – Okay, that's mm-hmm. that's my guy. Mm-hmm. Not only is he a cool customer, a really normal, honestly, young man. He's not a diva by any means. He is so talented, and he can lead me to the next level on top of you know what LSU can do. So that's where LSU's situation is, is they have this immensely talented quarterback committed in this class who is recruiting these guys really hard as well. And it's going to be hard for skill position players as in particular to say no to joining up with him. And so I, I love where LSU stands with DeCorian Moore. He is just somebody that will ultimately be a battle to keep and, and other schools aren't going to give up. And, and that's what you want. I mean, you want to be recruiting at this level. You want to be, you know, every year I feel like we've had the discussion of, okay, top five class, LSU's doing a great job recruiting. But LSU fans, of course, and the coaching staff want to see them go and get the number one class. Well, when you recruit at that level, you're going to have these recruiting battles that are true heavyweight fights. And and that's what you're getting with a DeCorian Moore in particular is a heavyweight fight. Uh, It seems like they're still shopping wide receivers as obviously they got DK Moore. They've got. Uh, is it Francis from Louisiana who is the, the, the top player at that position? And then I look up and they're going after uh, Kalik Lockett, who is another big-time player, and it looks like they're trending in the right direction for him. Where where does his recruitment stand? Yeah, another another prospect who's kind of shaping up to be an LSU-Texas battle, and, and this is where sometimes uh, in recruiting we like to say the numbers work out, but will they really work out for LSU in this favor where they can land DeCorian Moore and Kalik Lockett? That would be just a perfect situation for the Tigers to reel those guys in together and team them up with Bryce Underwood on top of Teron Francis in Louisiana and to go after two players that Texas wants so badly and, and to take them from, you know, kind of one of their recruiting, you know, battleground areas 
would be huge. And and I think Khalid Clock has came away really, really impressed with LSU. Off of his spring game visit, he was at uh, Texas's spring game uh, the week prior. So um, that is something to watch. I, I feel like it is shaping up to be an LSU-Texas battle. I think USC is a little too far for him. Florida State is a school that's kind of sleeping and uh, is maybe being slept on a little bit in the recruitment, but uh, they're in the mix, and then A&M's in there as well. So at this stage, I would say it's probably an LSU-Texas battle for Khalid Lockett, and uh, if, if they can get him on board, that would be huge. He can pretty much commit at any time, but in all likelihood, he's going to take some officials and then make a decision. Um, and we've got one from a chat uh, coming in. Uh, KC, hashtag Ask Billy. Uh, LSU recruiting update on Jermaine Lowell. I believe that's the Texas Tech defensive tackle. Uh, Louisville. Louisville. Yes, Louisville. 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 Louisville, sorry. Yeah, he just entered the portal. And, and any anytime there's a defensive tackle this stage with, with LSU, they're going to go after him um, and, and try to reel him in. Right now they've got Philip Blitty, uh, who has an offer he visited. Uh, he's uh, fresh off an Auburn visit. He visited Washington as well, and then he goes to OU this weekend. And there's just kind of reading the tea leaves a little bit. Uh, I feel like LSU's right in the mix there. He loved what Bo Davis can do for him. He's viewing this kind of as an opportunity to win a championship. And if you, I mean, really, if you really look at his schools uh, that he's that he's looking at, the one that's that's probably most primed to have that opportunity is probably LSU. And uh, unless I guess if you went all the way out to Washington and they can somehow piece it together, but uh, LSU is the one that go- is going into this year with probably the most buzz around winning a, a championship and, and going to Atlanta and doing all those things. So, um, and he understands the need uh, at his position. So they're very much in on Philip Liddy. They just offered CJ West, uh, who's a Kent State transfer, who's a really productive player from that level, who's got offers now from Arkansas, Miami, Texas A&M, and others. So he's, again, you look at the defense tackle position, very highly competitive um, position in the spring transfer portal window. But he's a big man who can step in and be a be a key piece to your rotation right away, I feel like. And so they offered him. Haven't seen, uh, at least as of this morning, that LSU's gone out and offered uh, Jermaine Loyal from uh, Louisville just yet. But he's one to, to keep an eye on because with these defensive tackles, I mean, I think everybody saw it in the spring game. LSU needs to bring in another transfer. They have Gio Paez from Wisconsin coming in. They have Dominic McKinley coming in this summer, but they got to, they got to add one more. And, and so I think everything's on the table when it comes to defense tackles, but I haven't heard of a, of a full push just yet. Um, but I've also been chatting with you fine folks here as well. So, um, Well, Bill, do we need to let I you know, do, do I can take a hint. Jesus. <laughs> That's right. No, no, I'm just saying, like, things move fast, yes. honestly. It's, it's yeah. crazy with the portal window. I mean, they, they – How do you monitor you can, it? Like, what do you do? Like, I mean, do you have, like, notifications set like, up? Are you constantly like trading monitoring? Stocks? I mean, your wife's yeah, going to be like, get off your phone. <laughs> no, seriously. I know. I know. We have we have family time around here. Uh, Tommy time as, as of now uh, with, our, with our little boy. Uh, but, yeah, it's – no, I would highly recommend people to, to – uh, shameless plug here, but follow the tran- – it's called – it's transfer portal underscore uh, on Twitter and throw it on alerts. Um, that's our on three transfer portal tracker. And as soon as guys go in, uh, they tweet it out. So that's the way to keep up with it. But – uh, there's also just the, I mean, there's so many rumors too. I mean, yeah. Cormani McClain, the Colorado defensive back goes in and rumor mill starts going, Oh, Corey, Corey Raymond recruited him at Florida. Well, he also spurred him, uh, spurned him at the last second at Florida. And he's kind of, you know, mm-hmm. an interesting transfer, uh, that has hit the portal, but, uh, you know, quickly, you know, Shea and, and, and our staff at the Bengal tiger ruled out LSU being a player for him. And so it's just the, the, the rumor mill just gets going really quickly because it is instead of things being drawn out over a couple of years, like in a high school recruitment, you have days that these guys are in entering the portal and then setting up visits. And so it just moves really fast and, and uh, it's uh, a sprint uh, for sure. Uh, Bill, what were your takeaways from spring football for LSU? I don't know how much you were paying attention to it, so I apologize if you didn't get a chance, but some of the storylines that popped for you over the last 15 workouts for, for LSU this spring. 
Yeah, uh, I was lucky enough uh, around 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning uh, a couple times to rewatch the spring game. <laughs> Uh, so that was kind of what I put on the TV. I was like, oh, this is fun. Um, and I don't know how many times I've rewatched the spring game, but, uh, in the past, but this year I certainly have, uh, no, I, I, I think for me, uh, this defense probably has a, a little bit of a ways to go. Sure. And, and I, I think that it's just going to be a process. And I think with Blake Baker coming in, the thing that you really want to do is you want to obviously find out who can play. And I think that's what the spring was about. Now you can see what happens over the course of their summer development and getting players in that maybe can help right away. Um, we'll look at you know where the defense tackle position stands coming out of the um, you know transfer portal window, if they can upgrade that. Um, they, they do have some talent. They have some linebackers that can really play if they get developed the right way, which we know Blake Baker can do that. Um, Demo Clark was back in town, so that's a prime example of that. Uh, but Gabe Relifer, kind of the edge position really impressed me. Paris Shan, um, Braden Swinson's obviously back too. So I think that group is in a good spot on the edges. They just really need to upgrade the interior. And then I am uh, I think I speak for most people, but I'm pretty concerned about the, the secondary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it could be a group overall that, yes, you have some key pieces that are, are back and um, – all of that, but I, I think it's it could be an adventure if they can't get pressure on the quarterback and really create uh, some some opportunities where they can get the quarterback to get rid of the ball a little early and and all of those things. So um, that that position group between the safeties and the corners is still um, in in need of some work and development. I think they're going to have to eventually lean on some younger players, you know, like a Kylan Jackson to to step up. Um, we saw you know, P.J. Woodland emerge. Does that hold true uh, when it comes to the fall and the, the live bullets start flying? You know, Ashton Stamps, uh, can he step up? Guys like that, um, you know, that, that the secondary really, um, especially kind of tackling-wise, just pretty, pretty worrisome. Um, but offensively, I mean, on the bright side of things, I liked what the offense is, is going to be able to do, um, which, I don't, again, speaks to maybe the defense. But uh, they've got the veteran offensive line coming back. I uh, love what DJ Chester brought in the middle at, at center. I like, honestly, I saw we saw a lot more. I felt like creativity in, in some of the run scheme when it came to the blocking scheme, mm -hmm. uh, which was nice to see. I, I think that's going to potentially allow – you know, a guy like Caleb Jackson this Ooh. fall to really emerge. You've got Josh Williams coming back. And then if Garrett Nussmeyer can get a little bit more help from his receivers, you know, you have Kyron Lacey, who looks like he's going to be the guy this year. C.J. Daniels, I thought, was really impressive. Xavion Thomas was uh, had the big play uh, down the field from Nuss. All of these guys have potential to be very, very good. They need one of them to emerge to be that dude. Um, if, if Nuss is going to have a successful year, in my opinion, it, it might look a little different than in the past, obviously with, with Jane Daniels and having Malik neighbors and Brian Thomas, and obviously Kyron being the third, but they need somebody to kind of have that summer where they emerge as, you know, potential first round draft pick and, and uh, Kyron could do it. CJ could do it. Xavion could do it. It's just a matter of who ends up doing it uh, for that passing attack to really, be be rolling come come SEC play. You mentioned Woodland, um, man. I tell you, Relaford, Woodland, and McBride. I don't know if it's because LSU is just kind of desperate for players on yeah. that side of the ball, and they just pop. But those cats look like they are McBride a, a, as too. good as yeah, as good as advertised. Yeah, I I love Gabe. I mean, I I was uh, last spring around this time. I was beating the drum uh, for Gabe Relaford to get his offer and, and for us to move him up into the on 300 and all those things. And, um, you know, he obviously went on to do all of those things and, and end up at LSU. So it was very important, very, very important that they got Gabe Relaford. Yeah. I'm with you. When you look at PJ Woodland, how much of it is the need for somebody to just be there at corner and want to tackle and have that willingness. And um, he's, ultra competitive. I mean, he camped last summer. He's had, he's had such an interesting journey. He probably has a massive chip on his shoulder, to be honest with you, uh, just because he camped last summer. And I mean, honestly, his performance was one where, I mean, between media and LSU and all the things, I mean, it, it was kind of clear, okay, I think they're going to go in a different direction at corner. And then he commits to Mississippi State, 
He goes on to have an incredible senior year, and LSU turns the heat back up on him and gets him on board. And uh, they're glad they did, I'm sure, because he's going to be a depth piece for, for them uh, this season. And, you know, hopefully uh, he can emerge and be that be one of their, their reliable corners. Um, and then Deshaun is, is just, you know, looks the part. Mm. Um, Safety is a really difficult position to play. But when you have that size, length and athleticism, it, it certainly makes it easier. Uh, last one, Bill, get you out of here. Anything on Jacoby Matthews? Nope. Uh, I don't. I don't see that one happening. Uh, I, I think he's going outside the SEC. Uh, any? I, I, I don't think he can transfer right. uh, within Florida. Right, so. Florida State and Oregon, the two teams to watch. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what uh, uh, that's what we're hearing on the on three side of things is Florida State and Oregon, and Florida State has some New Orleans area recruiters on staff. Um, Oregon, uh, they just I don't know if he wants to get away from from home or whatever, but. Um, or what their situation is. But, yeah, those are the two schools we're hearing early on. Uh, Bill, congratulations to you and the wife, you on the addition. It's great to see you again, my friend. We'll talk again soon. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk soon. There he is, Billy Embody. Make what sure and follow room. him on three to keep up yeah. with the latest transfer portal. Great room. Got- 